Hey friends, I'm Cal Walters, and I'm here to tell you that leadership matters. Leadership is a choice. It's available to all who are willing to learn about it, to pursue it, and to implement it in all of its messiness. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Intentional Leader Podcast. Let's go make it count. All right, Ryan Hawk, welcome back to the podcast, man. So great to have you on today. Cal, I've told you since last time we, we recorded, uh, I was looking forward to this already. So I'm really appreciative of you and all the work that you do, man. I was pumped to, be, pumped to come back. Well, it's an honor. It's so fun to be able to flip the mic on you and ask you some questions. I, I honestly, Ryan, I, I love your podcast. I also specifically pursue episodes where you're being interviewed because I think you're really a gifted speaker. You just have such a wealth of knowledge to pull from. And I'm really excited about your new book, The Pursuit of Excellence. And we're going to dig into that today. And uh, one thing I know for sure, I already mentioned off off camera that uh, we're definitely going to run out of time. So I'm excited to (laughs) to dive in and uh, maybe that'll just set up another good conversation. But I wanted to start. So I know you're curious. I know you're a learner. Uh, but you also chose to pursue leadership as a specific topic. I mean, you could have picked any type of podcast, but you specifically chose leadership. And I also know that you've got some really amazing leaders in your life. You mentioned Dean Hawk in your in your book uh, at the acknowledgments. You, you've talked about your father, Keith. Uh, one of my favorite episodes that you have is your conversation with your wife, Miranda. So Tell us a little bit about, just talk about, let's start with Dean, because you mentioned him at the beginning of your book, uh, your grandfather. Talk to us about him and and maybe why he, in your mind, embodies leadership. Uh, man, I love starting here. I think you know that. And so I appreciate uh, any opportunity to talk about him. So my dad's dad, my grandpa is um, kind of the definition of being a servant leader. His as long as I've known him, he's always been others focused. Um, one of my aunts, my dad's sister, uh, was special needs and lived for many years and needed him, need, needed my, my dad or my, my grandpa, my dad's dad, to take care of her, her entire life from start to finish. So 40 plus years of that. And he did everything for her. Then my, my dad's mom, my grandma got sick towards the end for the last wow, it was years. And he did the same for her where he, like, she was always first, no matter what, he never, ever, 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 ever once complained. He never acted like it wasn't a great day. He was so happy. He is so happy. I know like to watch us play sports and was so proud. Always wore like the the hat of our team came to our games, even if he's wheeling two people in wheelchairs and doing all this stuff, but never complained. And I think to me, that's, that's why, like, I wanted to dedicate it to him because I've, I think I've, I'm nowhere near that level of being that selfless yet, but my dad is the same way as him. Like, I think he probably got some of that from him. And I think that's just a great quality. It's an amazing quality in a leader in a person is his, that their mission is essentially there to help other people, to help people that they love. And it's not only that he does it with everybody else in his life too. He was the mayor of Sabina. He runs stuff at his church. He's always trying to help people give money away, even if he doesn't have it, you know, like all of that stuff to me is, is, is a great reason to, to dedicate something to him and just to try to get closer to that in your own life. So that's why I wanted to shine a bright light on him. He doesn't get stories written about him or anything like that, but he definitely should. He deserves it. I love that. It makes me think. So I think Andy Stanley talks about the, the people that are closest to you, uh, hopefully have the best things to say about you. And, uh, I, I think, uh, do you, Dean and Keith, your father, do you all live near each other? I, I, I'm not, I know you're, I know you live in Ohio. I'm not we're, sure. We're within, uh, we're within like 40 minutes of my grandpa and I'm within 15 minutes of my dad. So close enough to where we get to get to see one another, um, a, you know, a decent amount. And I think I see my dad more often. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's neat to do that. My grandpa also was, he started pushing me to be a writer and to write books when I was in college. And he's like, I love for you. Cause we talk about football and I played football in college and he'd say, I love, I love how you explain football to me. Cause he didn't really play. And I would love for you to write a book about playing football. And I said, I don't know if like, there's probably better people to write that book. So I think he's, he's glad that I've written books 
but uh, I haven't written the football book because I just said like there's there are plenty of other one they already exist and they're they're well better than well much better than what I could do. So I'm going to be over here in this leadership space, which does still touch on some football. So I think that's the other cool thing about it is like when people push you to do things, you're like, what? Why? Who am I to do that? Um, you know, some of that kind of imposter syndrome you and I were talking about before. And uh, and so I, I kind of like fulfilling some of some of that, which has been said to me now for for a while. And tell us about your dad, Keith. Yeah. And he does he go by pistol? He does. He's, he goes okay. by pistol. So I um, mean, quick quickly on on the nickname part. When my younger brother and I were, um, I don't know, elementary slash middle school age, he showed us these videos of Pistol Pete Maravich and these behind the back passes and through the legs and these crazy shots. And he averaged a billion points a game before there was even a three point line, you know, pistol Pete was the best. And we go on the driveway and we try to mimic him doing all the through the leg stuff. And my dad would do it. And he was not as, as athletic as us when he was trying to do it. So we, we started that nickname by making fun of him by like, you think you're pistol Keith, his name is Keith. You, you think you're pistol Keith, like pistol Pete. And that got shortened to pistol. And for some reason, like, you know how Kyle, sometimes nicknames are weird, how they stick. And, and then as we introduce my dad to our friends and teammates and things like that, we're like, this is pistol. So everyone else calls him that. And then it really stuck. So that's kind of, uh, it's the neat thing when you hear like, uh, Aaron Rodgers goes on my brother's show with Pat McAfee every Tuesday. And, he, and he's like, what's pistol and Jude's doing? You know, my mom's Judy, what's pistol. And so it's kind of funny to hear that, that everybody else still calls him by, uh, by the nickname that we made up for him many years ago. What do you, when you think about your dad, obviously you've talked a lot about him as a, as just a great example of leadership, but w- are there any moments that really stick out to you about your dad as a leader? Or just, I mean, it could even be just him, the way yeah. he raised you guys, or just, I mean, I know that he's been a leader at LexisNexis. Anything about, yeah. any moments that really stick out to you? I, I think a couple things. Uh, one, um, in now as a dad, I try to do the same. Whenever we asked to do anything like sports related at any hour, at any on any day, the answer was always yes. We go out and catch passes or throw passes, yes. Rebound, free throws, yes. Take us to the batting cages, yes. Help us uh, buy weights so we can lift in our basement, yes. Uh, like always, yeah. And then you'd go down there with us in the basement, or you go out in the backyard, or go in the driveway. So I think like this presence, this this, um, uh, I am always going to say yes. And uh, from a presence perspective, P R E S E N C E, right? Always be there type presence. That was like the best gift that he gave us and still gives us to this day. So I'd say that. And then the other part, which I've I mentioned the story before, but you know, my dad was a senior leader at a, at, at a company where there was a, roughly a thousand people that reported up through him. And, and also I think became known as a mentor for a lot of people where they call him. And this still happens to this day. I know I've just talked to him about this where um, somebody calls him and they're going through a rough patch in their career, or maybe they got fired or something really bad happens. And they would, you know, this is before cell phones. When I was growing up, they would call the house phone and my mom might answer and it was for my dad and she'd hand him the phone and he'd sit there and kind of pay. And, you know, we're all kind of around, you could see him. He just patiently kind of listen and offer a little things here and there. And then maybe towards the end of the conversation, he would have a little bit more to say. And then he would always end with something along the lines of, yeah, I can help you out or I can make an introduction or I could do something. Right? He'd give some sort of parting advice. He'd offer to help them. He would make some introduction. He'd hang up the phone and we'd say like, well, what was that? What was that all about? And he would say, you know, so-and-so is, is going through something rough. I'm just trying to help him out, just trying to help him out. And it was just kind of like, that was just normal. Right. And I think what was cool was one that so many people reached out to him for help, reached out to him for advice. They, they, they valued it so much. And his mentality was just kind of like, just trying to help him out. Just mm-hmm. like no big deal. It wasn't like a teaching moment for us. Like, Hey guys, when you grow up, you better list, you know, he wasn't, he didn't do it. He just lived it. He just mm-hmm. did it. And I think that's the best form of leadership when you just do the work, when you just mm-hmm. do the thing and then your kids see it and they think that's normal. That's how we're supposed to be when I wish it were more normal, but it's not uh, mm-hmm. both people. So many people wanting to reach out as well as just him saying, I'm just trying to help them out just trying to help them out. Like no big deal. I'm just trying to help them out. Like it mm-hmm. didn't make a big thing. Didn't look for awards or recognition, just trying to help them out. And I think, I, I, I think a lot of that is now in all of us, the three, his three boys that we try to try to do the same thing. 
it, it makes me think of just the simplicity sometimes of leadership. I, I think sometimes, I don't know that we overcomplicate it, but I think we forget that sometimes it's doing the things that we were taught as a kid, like lead by example, do the right mm -hmm. thing. I mean, it just sounds like both Dean and Keith were both people who did the, did the simple things, uh, but did them actually took, actually followed through on them, took, take care yeah. of people. Yeah. It's more like it was like show don't tell it. Just, yeah. just do it. Just do the thing. I think that's, that's kind of a, uh, be, be a person of action, be, be an example setter. I mean, that's part of being a leader is you have to do it the right way all the time yourself. And that's the number one thing I think of as a parent is, especially as my girls get older is they, they may not be necessarily listening or, or acting upon what you say, but they're definitely watching. They definitely mm -hmm. are seeing what's going on. And so that's, a, that's another reminder of like, let's do it the right way all the time, every time, no matter what, even if they aren't necessarily seeing it, but just to be the type of person that you want to be. And so I, I try to embody that. I'm, I, I realized too, Cal, I think the amazing amount of good fortune and privilege that I have by being brought up in that environment. And, and I didn't know that though, when I was being brought up, I just thought it was normal. And so now as you meet more people, especially you go into like a college football locker room and you meet a bunch of, I'm sure you had the same thing being from the military background where you meet people from all different circumstances, all different walks of life, all different ge geographical lo locations, different family structures and what their parents were like. I was like, Oh, wow, I'm super fortunate and, and I'm grateful for that now that I, that I realize that this is not necessarily normal, but because of that too, that's like a motivating factor mm -hmm. to not waste it, to like make yeah. the most of things. Because when, when, you know, you're fortunate enough to have good people that, that, that are your parents and extended family members, like let's make the most of the opportunities that have been given to you. Is that something you think about a lot? Cause I, I'll be honest. I'm a, I'm really impressed and and just fascinated by your ability to be so consistent. You you've released 400 plus podcast episodes every Sunday at 7 p.m. You send out a Monday morning uh, email. I don't know how many are you at now. You're at like 293. 293. You never miss. A Monday, not to mention the fact that you're a, a father of five kids, you've got a wife, you've got speaking engagements, you've put out two books now. Like what I, I just I just wonder what does Ryan Hawk think about at 5 a.m. in the morning when maybe he's like, Man, I don't really want to do this today. Or do maybe or do you not even think that? Does that never like I just what do you go to for motivation when to stay so consistent? Mm. Yeah, that's a really good good question. Um, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, I think it's a combination of things. One, as you as you mentioned, like I do think about um, the fortunate situation I've been born into that I, I didn't I did nothing to deserve that, right? So I want to make the most of that, given with my my family structure, my parents, and my brothers. Um, and now I think it takes on a whole as again as you know takes on a whole other light when you become a dad because um, I, I'm always thinking about if, if, and I know they're not watching that closely because they have their own lives, but they are noticing things that I just want to do it the right way. I want to model the way that things were modeled for me and the thing that, and the way that things are modeled for me by my parents. So like I am motivated from a family structure of of just trying to be a good model of what a good person does. And, and so one, one of my values is being thankful. And the definition of that for me may be different than most, which, but the way that I show gratitude is to try to leave people, places, and things better than I found them. Hmm. Right? Not groundbreaking like rocket that. science, but that's, this is a way for me to show gratitude, to hmm. me to show that I'm thankful for what I've been given is to leave people, places, and things better than I found them. So if there's trash on the ground, pick it up. If you reach out and you need something, whether it's to write a book or you want to intro, help you out, man, right? You're a good dude. I want to help that. If I'm able to do that, then I will have left you better than I found you, right? And so people placing things better than you found them. And I think that's a, that to me is a way that I show gratitude for, for these things. And I feel like too, if, if I continuously show up and try to leave people placing things better, things seem to work themselves out. As Bill Walsh might say, the score takes care of itself. And 
Um, so I try to have some sort of a code, a set of a, 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 a core values that I live by and the actions that are bait that are, that go along with those core values. And, and if I do that, <clears throat> I found like, you know, consistently, as you mentioned, which is a big deal for me. If I, if I do that, then, then like good things seem to happen, doors seem to open, but I have to kind of keep my head down and, and keep at it. And, and, and when I do that, um, usually the results are, are pretty good. Are you one of those people that is generally pretty positive? Like, do you do you have a lot of days where you're where you don't feel motivated to do? Because again, this is hard work. I, I don't think people realize how, unless you've tried to do a podcast, just how much work that takes to research for the interview, to do the interview. It, it's great, and then to put together the podcast. I'm just wondering, are are you? Because some people are just more positive and just kind of stay motivated. Are, are you, do you feel like you're one of those guys that's just a little bit, maybe doesn't have a lot of bad days, I guess. I mean, I try to, I try to make them good. I, I try to, I mean, as a parent, I say, you know, you have, you, you get to choose your attitude and your effort and how you respond to moments, good or bad. Like that's, those are choices. Now I will say a huge caveat that I am very fortunate. I grew up with Parents who are very positive, especially my dad, one of the most optimistic humans on the planet. And the only person who might be more optimistic than him is my wife, Miranda. So I, I'm very attracted to that quality in her. She knows this. We talk about it all the time where she grew up different from me um, and has had to really grind and is super tough, um, but as always has a big smile, so optimistic, a huge energy just for everything. And I think when you're surrounded by that 24 seven, it's hard not to have some of that wear off on you. So I've been surrounded by that since I was born and I married someone who's like that. So to me, I would say that's a huge help because if I went home and the person that was there was negative and a complainer and said, this is not going to work, or I don't know about this, or no, you shouldn't leave that job and take a huge pay. If they were like that, man, I don't know what would happen. It, it would, it, I can promise you it wouldn't be this. That's for sure. So I would say that's a big part of it too, is when you're surrounded by that, especially your partner, that makes a massive difference. And that's, that's huge for me in order for things to, 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 to kind of continue to go along and, and, and going well. When it comes to the podcast and the consistency, that's just out of sheer love. That is a curiosity. That is an obsession of mine. I am fascinated by doing exactly what you and I are doing right now, which is having long form thoughtful conversation led, led by curiosity with, with other people. Um, I like one-on-one -on -one talks more than like group interactions. And so to me, it's, it's just kind of the perfect platform to live my life by is that I can, I can go out and choose all of my favorite people to talk to, whether I'm going on their show or they're coming on mine. And is, I mean, is that a cool way to live? Like, that's pretty fun. Like there's certainly a lot of work we prepare, you know, we have an outline, we get ready, we read the books, we do all that stuff. But like, that's, that's part of the fun, man. Like that's part of, I mean, just like in the military, it's not like you're going to go out and fight a battle and not prepare or not have a plan or not like, no, not define what success of this mission looks like. You got to do it or the courtroom same way. Right. So I think, I, I think that's kind of, and there's just my, like my overall mentality and thought process around all of that. Let's talk about who, uh, in a sense of who luck and Jim Collins and that idea, because that, that kind of gets at Miranda and just how positive she is, how you're attracted to positive people. One of the things that, that stood out to me on, uh, it was episode 375 where you and Miranda, where you interviewed Miranda, which was fantastic. And I, I'm going to link to that in the show notes because I enjoyed that so much, uh, especially for, for couples. I think it's just a great example of a loving, supportive relationship. But you and Miranda are very intentional about who you surround yourself with. Talk to us a little bit about that. What, like, how do you think about that? What's your framework? Because obviously, there's different areas that we interact with people. There's professional relationships. You know, there's mentors. There's mentees. There's, uh, you know, all sorts of relationships. But like, what are some of the ways that you guys have tried to pursue the right people around you in in your marriage and in your in your life? I think a lot of that is around energy. Um, when we talk about people that are in our lives or that we want in our lives, it's, do they, are they kind of lifters or leaners? 
um, you know, the, the leaners are the ones who are constantly kind of leaning on you, complaining, um, like luck is, doesn't seem to, to strike them well, I guess, or at least in their mind. Um, lifters are the ones who, who are there to like bring the juice, have positive energy. They're excitable. They're excited. Um, they, they care about you, right? They're curious. And, and so one of the things that happens, I think, if, if you're kind of on the path that we are, not that we're better than anybody, but if you're on the path of just trying to grow and improve and better ourselves, that, 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 that there may be some people who were or are in your life who are on that same path. Who, who are maybe um, just kind of status quo, whatever, I'm just trying to get through the day, or maybe they're getting worse or whatever. And I know everyone's got stuff they're dealing with. I fully get that. And you got to be there for your friends. But over time, we just kind of analyze who do we want to spend our time with? Because quite frankly, Cal, I, I'm sure you know, like the same way, you don't have a ton of extra free time between kids and being Uber drivers for them and taking them to sports <laughs> events. Like there's not there's not a ton of extra time. So when we do have it, we just talk about that. And at times you make choice to say like, you know, I just think that person grew this way and we grew this way and, and we're, we're no longer going to hang out with them. And that's just life. And, and so I, we just really think about that as of energy of lifters and leaders and who are the people that we want to surround ourselves with? Who do we want to try to lift? Who do we want to be with? We, you know, I think the best way to, it was a Charlie Munger. I think he said it like how, how to, how to get a great wife, deserve one. I think how to get a great friend, deserve one, right? How to be, if you, if you want to be surrounded by great friends, you need to deserve them. Meaning you got to be a great friend yourself. It's just like put Charlie, my daughter on the bus a few hours ago. And I said, Hey, be a great friend, be a great teammate, lift others up, be there for them, you know, that type of thing. So I think that's just, that's, that's how we think about that. And at times though, like I think Miranda's probably even better than this at me. There, there are people that you just kind of grow apart from and she'll be upfront and tell them that. And those are, <laughs> those are tough conversations, <laughs> but it's, I admire it. Cause it's, it's hard, but it's just being straight. And sometimes those people like it's a wake up call mm. be like, Oh man, what's going on. And I think that's, that's what a, a good, honest friend will do. And you talk about this in your book and look, we're going to shift to your book. Uh, it, it, so much of it is about who we're becoming. And mm -hmm. I certainly who we hang out with is forming us in some mm -hmm. way, good or bad. And uh, so I want to I want to dig into this truly excellent book, The Pursuit of Excellence. Uh, I'm really excited to dig into this. And like I told you off camera, there was no one. As soon as I saw a title, I was like, Ryan Hawk was the perfect person to write this book. Because one, I mean, your question that you have asked 400 plus guests is, what are the commonalities between those that sustain excellence over time? Mm -hmm. So first question is, how did you become interested in that? Because you, you started asking that question early on in your podcast. So excellence has been on your mind for years and years and years. Why did you become interested or how did you become interested in the pursuit of excellence? Yeah, I, um, well, in the, in the athletic world, like there's a lot of that talk, you know, you're playing sports and probably in the military world as well. You're playing sports and, and you think about the, 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 the productive achievers and, and that's why the productive achievers is in the, the, the subtitle for my book, because those are people who achieve great things and they do it in a productive way for society, for themselves, for other people. So productive achievers is also a big, a big part of, of what excellence is all about to me. Um, I actually just kind of offhandedly asked it, and I don't even remember the first time I did it, but I, I, I asked it to a, a random guest and I remember really liking their, their answer. And then I just started asking it to everybody and some people would have a good answer and some people would not. And, and some people it would, it would, it would create these great stories. I remember I talked to Kat Cole about that and she was episode 78 and she talked about, you know, having courage and confidence, but this equally balanced with curiosity and humility. And I thought, oh my goodness, like she, the unlock that provided, I went down a huge rabbit hole and still do when it comes to this being curious and, and, and humble and, and courageous and confident. And I thought, I, I just want to get this viewpoint from everybody. And now I just started basically writing a book off of one question and, and then really kind of synthesizing that and expanding beyond that uh, to find other amazing stories out there. And there are so many of them, if you're willing to kind of do the research and do the work. So to me, I just, I, I think you, you have these moments 
where maybe you're surprised and that then is like, oh, I want to keep doing this. I want to keep doing this. I'm fascinated by this. And that's how the book became uh, what it was like 80 some thousand words. It, it's published is now 60 ish, I think is where we landed. But it, it, it became like just this giant project that I was already doing and, uh, and, and thought, well, this, this has got to be the book. And then my, the, the, the Casey Ebro at McGraw Hill, she's my editor. Um, I remember we, we, we did a zoom call to talk about this idea that this would be my second book. And I think it was like seven minutes in and she was like, yes, we're doing this. You know, we're doing this. Let me talk to Jim, who's Jim Levine, my literary agent and said, I'll get it. I'll get it worked out. We're going to do this, get started, like get it, get it going. And that was it. I mean, then, we, then the way we went, I already had a ton of stuff that I had sent her. So I just didn't have like a fully fleshed out book, but I had a bunch of ideas and a bunch of notes. And at that point, I think she saw the excitement level on my face and that she said that and I wrote that in the acknowledgements, like her, her seeing me so excited, got me more excited to do it. And, and that's why I think this was actually, while it was a grind, it was still pretty, pretty cool and pretty rewarding to actually write it because I was like living in these stories of excellence every single day. It's kind of a fun place to live. How hard is it to write a book uh, compared to, I mean, you've done a lot of hard stuff, but like. A lot of people haven't written a book. I haven't written a book. I don't, I don't, I like what some of the stuff you're talking about, like publishing, literary agent, like that makes sense to me. But I have no idea what that looks like in terms of the grind. Like, how, how hard has it been for you to put, put a book together? It's hard. It's, I would say it's, um, yeah, work wise, it's definitely the most challenging thing that I do. And that's why I want to keep doing it because I think it's good to push your edges as, Navy SEAL Jay Hennessy uh, said to me, uh, you know, this, this idea of constantly pushing your edges is is really um, important to do. Uh, I, I, but but at the end of the day, though, um, it's it's about making a commitment to something, and so I I I've just said decided to make a commitment to doing it. I actually have my Excel sheet up here, right here of every day what I would do once we agreed to the deal. I just had the date. That I had the word count of the day and the topic that I wrote about. And my only commitment to myself is I'm going to write 100 words per day, every single day, no matter what. No misses. If you're sick, you got you to gotta bust out 100 words. If you feel great, you know maybe you can write 1,000 words. Right. No matter what, though, you have to show up every single day and do it. And that was a commitment to myself. I also hired a writing coach and an, a separate editor. So I had two different people who were there to kind of hold me accountable, but I think ultimately you got to hold yourself accountable to yourself, but also to kind of offer feedback on, in, a, in a live setting. So I was getting constant feedback on the work that I was sharing with them. It was being edited. It was being reformatted. It was the, the stories were becoming better by having help from other people. So it was one, it was about, I think, surrounding myself with a good team and then just making a commitment and then holding myself accountable. And I think if you do that, which you're the type of guy who has the discipline and the resources to do that. You could, you could do it. Now, there's no guarantee the book's going to be good, <laughs> but you could, you, could get, you could do it. You could do the, the, the project. You could get the thing done. The whole other part of the idea and why you're doing it and who it's for and how it's going to help them and how they can apply it, that all has to kind of be going on at the same time. And that's, that's why it's, it's, it's just really hard. A lot of people now are writing books and, um, um, but just not a lot of people are writing good books. So it's hard to break through and it's hard to do that. And that's, that's what I'm trying to do. And that's a hundred words. How, how long of a time period was that where you were committed to doing a hundred words? Are we talking um, months, years? You're yeah. Doing this that? was like a four, I'm looking at the sheet right now, like a four and a half month process. If I only would have written a hundred words, and I actually ended up putting this in the book, if I only would have written a hundred words a day, which was my minimum goal, I would have missed. So I was counting on the fact that there were days where I would feel great and I would go way over, which if you look at it, there are tons of days. The majority of the days I go way over. I set the small goal because anybody can write a hundred words a day. Anybody can do it. So that's why... Th because I just like, have you heard the, the never break the chain uh, from Jerry Seinfeld? Have you, heard him, have you heard him write or talk about this? It's familiar, but it's so, uh... Seinfeld essentially is, is he says, Hey, I'm a comedian. I'm a comic. That's, that's what I am. And I'm a writer, right? Comedians have to write all the time. 
And in his whole life, essentially, and I believe he's still doing this at the end of every day, if he wrote a joke, he just puts an X to the day on the calendar. And he says, never break the chain. Mean never have a day where you don't have the X on the calendar, but mm-hmm. even if it's just one joke, because I'm a writer, I'm a comedian and I write jokes and most of the jokes I write are horrible. <laughs> so I have to get, I have to keep at it in order to get to the good ones. That's why when you study creativity, Adam Grant's written a lot about this. Other people have, it's not a quality game. It's a quantity game. The most creative people, even if they're like inventors like Edison or others, they had the most inventions, the most patents on their work. Now, a lot of them you've never heard of, or they're not any good, or they're not useful at all. However, every once in a while, you'll have one that changes the world. So I think that that is an inspiring and motivating aspect of writing, of, of creating for me, is that there aren't like these geniuses out there that... They, everything they create is amazing. Now, there are people who are far smarter than me, but they still have a ton of terrible ideas. They're just willing to keep going. And so I have to be willing to do the same thing. So for me, that's kind of the never break the chain style. Once I committed to doing this, once Casey and I agreed to that deal, then it was like, here it is. I'm never going to miss a day. Even I, I got COVID in the middle of that, by the way, mm. but there was no chance. I was never going to miss a day no matter what, even if I felt bad, I'm laying in bed and bring me my laptop, right? Like no matter what, I'm going to bang out a hundred words. Um, and, and, and that to me was like, and then once your chain gets started, right. And all of a sudden it's like, you're 60 days in dude, you know, you can't miss then. Like you already got it started. You've got to keep it going. This is how like these apps gamify things, right? They create mm-hmm. streaks on Snapchat yeah. or other ones. Yeah. They know this is how our minds work. So 100%. Uh, that's, that's another part of that too, is like once the chain gets started, you don't want to break it. You mentioned that Excel sheet. Did you have a way of checking it off each day or some other way to exit out? I just have the dates here and then I have word count and then I have the topic that I wrote about, which is, it's, it's actually cool now. Now it's like a diary where I can look back on it and say, oh, uh, on, on November 16th of 2020, I wrote the story about being a griot, which is uh, an old storyteller and Dave Chappelle told this story on stage when he was accepting an award. And I happened to see a, a YouTube video of Dave talking about being a, being a griot, G R I O T is what a griot is spelled. And that, that actually ended up sticking, staying in the book. So I know on November 16th of 2020, I wrote that section of the book. So it's kind of cool. Now you go back through it and you see how long that story was originally and your topic and the day that you did it. It's kind of neat um, in, in that regard. And you mentioned accountability. Did you have anyone other than uh, the person you mentioned for accountability for this? Did you, did you, and you also mentioned that in your uh, New Year's uh, goals this year, just the importance of, and I guess you talked about publishing your goals or just having accountability uh, when you're trying to pursue something hard like this. Did you have specific people holding you accountable to this? Yeah, but I would say even I did. I had a writing coach and an, and an editor separate from that who they were just there to clean up. The coach was more of like a prompt person and he uh, would would offer like real-time feedback and he would help clean up some things as well. Um, and so in a way, he knew what I was doing because I had to turn something in every day. Um, it, but I, I really believe though this, like that helps for some and and, and it definitely helped me But ultimately, like, I just don't like the thought of lying to myself. And I think it would feel like a lie to myself once I make a commitment to do something that if I didn't do it, then I was a liar. And I hate the thought of being a liar, especially lying to myself. So I think that's part of it, too, is like making the choice, making the commitment and sticking to your word. And most importantly, not lying to yourself, because I don't know about you, like I try to feel good most days. That is a surefire, surefire way to feel really bad for me mm-hmm. is I feel like I've lied to myself. And um, so I, I'd say really it's like holding yourself accountable. But if you got to put other people in place to help out, by all means, you know, create the environment to, to set you up to do well. I love that. I, I've been thinking a lot about what does it mean to live an intentional life? And to me, that's a big part of it is just living in line with your values and, and not, not breaking your own commitments. I think that's where we tend to find the most fulfillment in life. Um, So let's dive into excellence because that word is important. 
And I think when I say that word, there's probably a lot of folks who have their own definition that comes to mind. Some people think about success. Some people think perfection, even you give a, you give a, a several uh, ideas of what it is. One line that really stood out to me is excellence is about the fanatical pursuit of gradual improvement. Uh, I found that to be to be helpful. What talk to us about what excellence is and, and maybe what it's not in your view? So, and this is some of the early readers have 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 said, well, no, isn't excellence a standard? And yeah, certainly it is. Like a, at Centerville High School, there's this tradition of excellence. Right, as these decades of domination where they won a lot. To me, though, I, I view it more as just a comparison against myself. So, uh, one of the sections is about success versus excellence, and why I, w- I will use that word sometimes, but I m- mainly steer towards excellence. I I found, and my friend Brooke Hup, Cups, who helped me formulate my values, and is a great friend and mentor for me. Brooks, I quoted him in there about this: that success s- seems to be more of a comparison to others. While, while excellence is a comparison to yourself, your previous self. So to me, I want to be able to look back a year, uh, uh, two years, a month, two months, whatever, and say, have I improved? Am I improving? Do my habits and my routines and my rituals that I have in place, what I'm actually doing each day, are they in line with my values? And they are, are they setting me up to be better tomorrow than I am today? That's like the regular prompt and, and the questions that I'm asking myself to make sure that that's happening. Am I, is it perfect? Of course not. You, you know, you mess up all the time, but that's like the, the general guidepost. That's the direction. So that's what excellence to me is, is being fanatical about that, about trying to get better and better and better. And that's why I'm such a believer in the score and the results will take care of themselves. If that's your kind of guiding your guidepost to say, this is where I'm headed. My North star is, is this, these, my processes, my actions, my behaviors are in place for me to ensure that I'm going to get better. It's not easy, right? This, this, this way of life is not for everyone, but to me, it's the most fulfilling. It's the way that I want to live and the people that I want to be around seem to, to live this way as well. How do you think about the different areas where you choose to be excellent? And maybe that's not how you think about it. So correct me on that because I, and I think you talked about this maybe with James Clear as well is like for me, I'll give you an example. And I'd like to know what you think about it. Like, I definitely want to be an excellent father. I want to just like, that is one of the most important, just, I want to be an excellent husband. I want to do excellent work when I go to when I go to work, when I'm at my job, when I'm leading my team. I want to do excellent work in the podcast. The problem I run into, and, and maybe I'm even using the wrong definition of excellence, is that sometimes something's got to give, right? Like I can't, mm-hmm. you know, like there's those moments in life where you're like, well, I really need to be there for my team. I could do a little bit more to be an, maybe an even better leader, but then I also got to get home to my daughter's soccer game. Right. So it's like choosing so I'm just curious, do you, do you think, do you, I guess, do you think we can be that excellent in every area? Like, how do you think about that? How do you think about the areas that maybe we choose to pursue excellence or maybe I'm even thinking about it completely in the wrong way? No, I, I think we're, we constantly have to make those choices and we're constantly probably iterating on that. There are probably chapters of your life, life where, where this changes. So I'm, I'm with you because uh, first and foremost, ahead of all of this work that we're talking about the top of the list is, is my family. So that, that comes before anything. So for example, this happened last night. They said, Hey, will you fly in on Sunday? Cause we want you to be a part of this leadership talk on Monday morning. We know your keynotes on Tuesday. We want you to be a part of this leadership talk. And I just said, no, I, 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 my, I have two basketball games that I'm not going to miss. Two different daughters have basketball games on that Sunday. I'm not going to miss those games. Am I, am I losing money? And am I losing another opportunity to be surrounded by all these senior execs? Yeah. Just giving it away. I think that's part. Of, I'm not. I'm, it sounds like I'm kind of virtue signaling. Like, look at me. I'm an awesome dad. But like, that's just part of the the, the priority list of saying no. And maybe I'll even push and say, hey, can we do the leadership roundtable in the afternoon? I'll fly in on Monday morning, and then we can do it in the afternoon, so I can maybe still uh, get a win out of it, but not miss. Like, it's just this constant thing of like, where do you draw the line? Where do you say no? What are you willing to do? Because if your priority list first is being there with my wife, being there at, at, at basketball games or whatever, that those things are important to me. Well, when then someone drops a big bag of money on your, on your chair and says, get here on Sunday. And you're like, 
hand it back to them and say, no, I mean, that's that to me is how you prove what's actually most important. Now, like I said, I'll still push and try to rearrange the meeting and do whatever I can so that I could have both of those things. But if push comes to shove and they say, no, sorry, it's happened at eight in the morning, you have to fly in the day before. Well, I'm not going to go. So I think those are, and I realize it comes from kind of a place of privilege and fortune and good fortune, but that's also because I've worked up to this point for many years to put myself in the position to be able to say no to that. And I know not everybody can, so I get that, but that's how I think about that is like when, because they're not really your values until you're forced to make hard choices, <laughs> right? They're, then you know what you actually value because if everything's just kind of smooth and easy, then it's fine. But you really know what you value when you are forced to kind of whether leave money on the table or an amazing opportunity to meet people or whatever. That's kind of how I view it, Cal. So it's almost like case by case basis, making trade-offs here and there. But for the most part, knowing your kind of priority levels um, and the fact of what comes first and what's non-negotiable, uh, I think those are just good prompts to, to have for yourself to think about uh, when each of those kind of ch- decision points c- come up in your life. What did you think about what James Clear said on your podcast, where he said, I think some of the effect of he'll, he'll compromise on the scope, but not on the quality of his work. And, and in a way, that's kind of what you're talking about almost there in a different way of like, I'm, I'm, I'm still going to do the quality work when I come to, the, to this leadership keynote, but I'm not going to be able to give you as much time as maybe you'd like. Yeah. Or not be as broad. Like he could right. go into more broader topics and he has decided not to do that, even though he could probably easily do that and probably would still do a really good job, but he, he's not willing to compromise on that. I, I mean, I, I love it. I think James is, you know, he, he lives, lives about an hour away here in Ohio. So I've got a chance to, to, to hang out with him a little bit. I think he is just a, a, a super clear thinker, a uh, really intelligent guy, obviously a great writer. Atomic Habits was the number one book sold on Amazon in 2021. Think about that. Ahead of all of other books, that's not even like within, within the realm of possibilities. So it, it couldn't happen to a better guy, though. Um, so I think I think that's really what it's about. It's, it's just like figuring out what are your... When I asked him for at the end of that conversation, Cal, you know, great pieces of advice, he said, I don't really think about advice. I think about questions. You know, what are you mm-hmm. optimizing for? Like, and then mm-hmm. we're talking, talking about the fact of... He doesn't, he's not optimizing to be famous. He wants his word, the word to spread, but he's not trying to, like, if you look at his social media posts, he's not in them. It's just the words of his books. So I think that's part of, he, like, he has those prompts and those questions for himself, and that helps him make decisions in his life. And I think we all should have those as we're thinking about what's most important to us. I want to talk to you about pursuit. Uh, cause you got, we've talked about excellence a little bit and, but that, that word pursuit is not by accident. You put that in there for a reason and you've got a section about pursuit. And interestingly, I, w- I went back and I listened to your conversation with Miranda and that was actually a big part of, of that conversation was how much you pursue each other. Hmm. And I, I was, it was interesting cause I was reading your book and then I was, I was going back and listening to that. Uh, but you have a great quote that I love, and let's talk about this a little bit. It's from John Maxwell. He told you on the podcast, he said, action shows intention. Nobody ever wanted to follow me when I was just sitting on my butt in the sand. And that's why I'm always moving. So tell, talk to us a little bit about how you think about pursuit in the well, pursuit asked, of excellence. Sure. I mean, I love that word. That's why it's in there. I asked John, I go, you've basically done all you can do. You're in like a hundred books. You got all the money you'll ever need why don't you just chill out on the sand, like go to the beach? And, and that's when he says, it's nobody, nobody wants to follow me when I'm sitting my butt in the sand. Like he, he has a calling, like he wants to do it. But I think, especially when it comes to relationships, that's, I think that's when problems arise as if you are no longer in pursuit. Like remember the days when you were in pursuit of your wife and like how hard you probably tried and what you did, but, but it, it may not be realistic to to be like that all of the time, but to have that as kind of a central thought in my mind, it's always there. And and I will text her most days. <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but <laughs> I'll say something like, "How can I make your day measurably better?" Mm. And and she'll laugh or like say something like, <laughs> "Whatever, make fun of me," but I, I actually mean it. And something it's as little as you know, pick up Chipotle or go to the store or like do an act of service in order to help out with the family or with home. She works full-time too. 
So, but, but just, but acting that and asking that and making it an open-ended question um, and then giving her the opportunity to basically say whatever she wants, I'm going to try to then do it. And selfishly, like it makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I'm being a better husband. It makes me feel like I'm being a better dad. If I can ask what is needed and then I can go do it. Like in a way we're doers. I know you're the same way. You're, we're like, let me like get something done. And so I will, I will pose those questions um, because I think those acts of service, which is a big part of her love language, um, are important um, to me uh, to fulfill those for her. And I think that shows kind of my pursuit. That's something you would do if you were pursuing somebody, if you were trying to impress them, if you wanted them to like you or love you, um, you may do those things. So I try to make those a part of my regular kind of daily occurrence to be thinking about that and those prompts and those texts or those questions can be the action part of that. Not just saying like, Oh yeah, we should go on a date night. And it's like, no, let's take it a step beyond just going on a date night. Like let's think about how she receives love and then give that to her as much as possible. Um, and, and even asking funny or weird questions in order to, to get there. But that's, that's part of kind of like what, what I try to do. I love that. How can I make your, your day measurably better? Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to steal that. Um, <laughs> you'll probably get, you'll probably get laughed at. I'll get laughed at. You, you might get some answers though. And then you can go do it. And like, I don't know about you when you get an answer, even like I said, if it's like, oh, we need to pick this thing up at the store and you go and do it and like run an errand. I, I feel like a sense of accomplishment, man. Hey, like I got it done. Like I got the mission done today. You know, so. 100%. I love it. I know that you just interviewed uh, Gary Chapman about the five love languages. My wife's the yeah. same way, acts of service. Like she, yeah. Uh, and so I, I am trying to often look, I don't do as great of a job as I should of, of following through on those things, but definitely <laughs> I can tell when, when I do the, those, those acts of service, it makes a big difference. And, uh, and it mean, it means a lot. Um, and, but I think action too, and I think that's a great way to think about it is just in a relationship. Uh, but, but action is one of those things that it's attractive. And to John Maxwell's point, it's really attractive. Like we just love, it's one thing to talk about. I could talk all day, like, Hey, I want to start a podcast or I want to write a book. People are like, ah, oh, cool, man. Like, yeah. But I think John, I've heard John Maxwell say this when people come up to him and, and ask about like, what do you recommend in terms of like writing a book? And he's like, well, how much have you, how much have you actually written of the book? And so there's that, you know, action creates momentum. Um, but what does that look like for you? Because I, I, I mean, you. We've talked about this a little bit already, but I mean, you are consistently doing the thing every week, and and you you know you could easily, after publishing that podcast on Sunday, say, you know what, I'm gonna just, I, I need, a, I need a break, like I need a month, I need a, I need a year, or hey, after writing Welcome to Management and that doing so well, you could have said, hey, I've got my book out. Like, how do you process that? How do you think about that? How do you, how do you just say, Hey, I'm on to the next thing. In a way, like it creates momentum, I think for me. And, and I'm, I'm kind of always thinking, I, I want to be really locked in for that podcast interview and th in, in the conversation. But then when that's done, it's almost like immediately I'm thinking of what's the next one or who can I, who can I reach out to? Who can I talk to next? Same thing when the book was done. I mean, I've, I had a conversation this morning with an author about the next book. Well, my book hasn't come out yet. I'm already kind of thinking about, I just like that thought of this, this forward momentum. And in a way it's like, well, now that the wheel is turning, I don't want it to stop. This may not be healthy. So I don't know if this is good, but this mm -hmm. is just how I am. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's just hard to, to stop. I just, and maybe that's why uh, there are moments where it's probably not fun to live with me, but I just can't. I would feel like I was like not living if I wasn't continuously going forward. And um, that's part of what this is. Now that some moment momentum has been, been, been created, let's go. I'm the same way with you or when Max wrote the book stuff, when people tell me the things they're about to do, I try to be nice, but then I'm saying like, dude, I don't care. Like, I honestly don't care what you're about to do. <laughs> what have you done? What are you doing? Right. What actions are you taking? about all of this. So, um, that's what I, that's what I, cause somebody said like, Hey, can you uh, introduce me to your, uh, uh, your literary agent? And I said, well, sure. Like send me what you've written. And then th they go, they go dark <laughs> or whatever, something like that. I mean, no, you have you, you, like, I care about, about like getting stuff done. There is a section in the book called talkers versus doers. 
And I like, I like hanging out with doers, man. I like hanging out with people who, who do it. You know, I was really big on not talking about my podcast with anybody outside of one friend who helped me and my wife and my brother before it launched. And I were I had to record for five months, four and a half months, 22 episodes before it launched. That's a long time. Um, I just, I just would rather do the thing as opposed to talking about what I'm about to do. Once we do it, we'll talk about it for sure, because we're, we've already done it and we're actively continuing to do it. But this, like, I'm about to do this, like my second book, I didn't, I didn't tell any friends that I had written. I wrote the whole book. It was all ready to go. It was completely done. I didn't tell anybody. And then until it was time to start promoting it at that point, yes, we're going to talk about it like crazy, but the whole thing, like, Hey, I'm writing a second book or I'm thinking about writing a second book or I'm in the middle of writing it. No, there was no talk at all with anybody at all. Other than again, Miranda was really the only one. And then McGraw Hill and my agent, <clears throat> nobody else really knew it was like, Oh, what another book it's wait, it's coming out. It's ready. Yeah, it's done. It's ready to go. And I'll, and I'll do the same thing hopefully with we'll see uh, in the future. But I, I just think in, in the world of talkers and doers, be a doer, be someone who has a bias for action. Uh, Don Miller talks a lot about that. And when I had him on my show and I love his viewpoint that he hires people who have a bias for action. He wants to be surrounded by those people. I completely agree. Like be someone who goes and gets the job done. Like when you think about in your world, in the military, the guys like that you want, like your foxhole guys, I mean, they're the ones who probably just go out and get the mission done, you know? And then, yeah, yeah they may like talk about it over beers or whatever, but like they're, 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 they go out and get the things done, man. Like, isn't that the kind of the person that we want to be? 100%. Yeah. hundred percent. And that's, what's attractive to, to human beings. And I, there's so many questions I want to ask you as follow-ups to what you just said. Uh, and I told you we'd run out of time here, but one, one or two quick ones, uh, one, how do you avoid burnout? Uh, with that? I mean, are there things that you do that you think help you avoid burnout when you're going so hard? I mean, I know you, I, I think in your conversation with Miranda, you talked about a pretty strict morning routine, uh, which is fairly common for high achievers, but I'm just curious from your, and the reason I have become more aware of burnout is one of my own experience of just trying to keep it all together, but also, uh, Carrie Newhoff. I'm not sure if you're familiar with his, his work, but he's, yeah, I went um, on his show last yeah you did, last you, book, you yeah. went on a show. Yeah. Um, you know, he's written about his experience as a pastor burning out. I'm just curious, yeah. are, are there any things you do you think that help you avoid that? Um, I don't know if I'm good at this. I, I don't know. I, I will say I do like, I do love doing nothing <laughs> at times. So watching mindless, like a reality TV show or being completely like out of the mind frame of, of this is going to be useful for a book or a podcast. Like I do, I do think I, I have the ability and I do try to do that. So in a way it's like, um, Sahil Bloom talks about working like a lion where like a lion spends a lot of time laying down and like mm -hmm. sleeping and resting. But then when it's time to go, they go, right? They know how to hunt. They can, they sprint. And so I, I think my work, a lot of it is there's like, there's this, these sprints mixed in with some, some laying down as opposed to like in the corporate world, it wasn't like that. I had this back to back to back meet, especially as you rise the ranks, you don't work like a lion. You work like I don't know, maybe a cow. You just kind of like are always just slowly moving to the next meeting. That's a, probably a horrible analogy, <laughs> but, but, but it maybe, but like the, then you shift to like, what I do now? And it's, we're going to sprint for this hour with you or whatever. And I'm going to sprint, you know, uh, when I do a, a interview later today, but in between that, I'm going to rest. So I think it's like figuring out how to like to, to organize your day to where, um, you're not just back to back to back to back all the time where you can spend time sprinting and then you could spend time kind of laying in the grass waiting for the next time to sprint. And maybe when you're doing that, you're reading and taking notes, but you're not doing anything that that's going to kill you. So to me, I think that's how, because a lot of people say it's seven years of your podcast, man, isn't it? Are you kind of tired of it? I'm like, I've never been more energized to do right. it ever. The preparation, the actual execution of it, the the publishing of it, the promotion of it. I love it. I love it. I'm trying to do more of it. So I would say that part of it, I guess there, that, that could happen someday, just not this day. So 
I'm, uh, I, I think that working like a lion analogy is, is probably apropos for kind of how I approach it. Well, uh, so as a wrapping up here, I want to ask you about these leadership circles that you do, uh, it, cause those sound really interesting. And, and I know that you're doing a lot of work. So also here in the end, I want to hear more about, you know, where people can find the book and some of the other, uh, exciting things you've got going on, but tell us about these leadership circles that you do. Um, so these are carefully curated groups of growth oriented people who are seeking more. They're seeking something that they're, they're they, they may not be getting somewhere else. So people apply, uh, on learningleader.com. They can apply to be a part of these circles there. Um, then I, there's an interview process after they apply. And then I make decisions on these groups, usually about 12 people. Uh, we meet roughly every three weeks on Zoom. They always met on Zoom, even long before the pandemic, because they're located all over the place. And then we usually meet one time per year in person. And I found them to be some of the most rewarding work ever because you're, you're, I get to play the role of being a teacher, a facilitator, a guide, an interviewer, um, mentor, um, and a learner alongside a lot of in, in impressive people. Uh, and I get to connect people who who had not previously known each other from different industries, different levels, different ages, different geographical locations. Like it's it, that's what's really neat. And then you know uh, my first group's still going on now; it's fourth year. And these people now, when they travel for work, instead of staying in a hotel, they're staying in the spare bedroom or the couch of of a, of a fellow uh, learning leader circle member. And I think that's really neat. And and one of the the best. I think compliments I feel like I've ever received. And you could tell, because I remember this has happened a couple of years ago. I get a, um, a, a direct message from the wife of somebody who's in one of my groups. And she said, he has grown so much as a husband and so much as a dad to our kids. And when we talk about it and I bring this up, he mentions what he learns in the circles. And I just, and, and I just wow. felt like, it was like an emotional moment for me to hear like, this isn't now. This guy has also been promoted multiple times in the last couple of years since we started working together. So it's not only that things are going well at work, but it, things are going better at the place that's far more important than any job he'll ever have, and that's with his wife and with his kids. And so, to me, like if we can put something together that changes their lives, and not only their lives, but the people that they love, their lives too. How awesome is that? That to me is like what it's all about. So that's why while those things are hard, there's a lot of prep and there's a lot of like uh, curriculum curation and figuring out what's best. But when you get notes like that and you see the impact you make, and then when you, bring, when you, when you all come together and you see how everyone like, builds this kind of love and friendships, that is a really good feeling, man. So if there's anything that maybe I would lean more into in the future is like doing more of that, of bringing people together that didn't previously know each other but maybe they had this one common interest and happened to be the learning leader show. And that, if that brings them together, then wow, like that's, that's real impact. And I, I love it. Wow. That's, that's what gets me so pumped about this work of just, you know, helping leaders or thinking about leadership. Cause then when the leader gets better, everyone gets better. Their families get better. Communities get better. Teams get you, I better. Mean, you have the, like you, have you, have you felt some of that going on? Like, is that some, some of the type of stuff that you want to do? Cause like you have the opportunity to do that. Yeah. I, that's, that's my heart. My heart's just to help people for really? sure. Um, yeah. So that, that's, that I love hearing about that. And I think, and I can just tell that's definitely something that, that gets you pumped and gets you excited, uh, which yeah. taking it full circle from the, how, where we started this, uh, you know, I think I see a lot of what sounds like your, your grandfather and your father and you, I mean, that just that heart to help people. Um, and I think that's, what's been cool to watch your journey is as you do all these incredible things, you're still willing to take an email from me or, you know, other folks and just help, help other people along your journey. So, uh, I mean, and, that's, and it, that's, I think that's part of the, that's part of the fun of this stuff. That's, 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 that's some of the reward hmm. I feel like is, is, is that is, is actually like in getting to meet somebody like you, Cal to where I'm, I'm super impressed, as you know, since I don't know how long we've been talking now is years. Yeah. It's been a couple of years, um, years to see like what you are doing. Like it inspires me, man. It mm -hmm. inspires me. This smart dude, this lawyer, this, this warrior lawyer. Like I'm, you have all these things that I don't have. Like a, most people mm -hmm. don't have them. So that's why I would just continue to, to encourage and push you, man. Like you have so much 
to give. And I know you're doing it, but dude, it's like, we're still on day one, you know, we're still <laughs> just getting started. So I, 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 I love what you're doing, man. You know, I'm a big fan. I'll always be a big fan. And so anything I can do to support all the, all the great things you're doing, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to help in any way possible. No, well, that means so much, Ryan. And, and this, this conversation has been awesome. Thanks for coming on today real quick. I think we got like, uh, we've already over time, but, uh, what, what tell folks about just where to find the book and uh, anything else you want people to hear on their way out? Well, I mean, the pursuit of excellence, right? It's, it's all about the uncommon behaviors of productive achievers. So um, I, I am a huge fan of this title. I'm more so than even my first book. I, lo- I love it. it not, nothing got tweaked at all uh, when we went through the process, which happens, did happen to the first one, did not for this one. So I love that. Uh, anywhere books are sold. Uh, obviously Amazon. And then everything for me um, is at learningleader.com. So whether it's my podcast, the Learning Leader Show, or either of my books or the other stuff we talked about circles, all that's at learningleader.com. And if you're not listening to Ryan's podcast, uh, please immediately stop listening to this and go go check out Ryan's podcast. And we'll certainly put links to all that in the show notes. Ryan, always a pleasure, brother. Thanks so much. And uh, I hope we can continue to, to connect as we, as we progress. Of course, man. Thanks so much, Cal. It's good to be with you as always. Man. Great to see you, brother. Bye.